you to a theologically very potentially deep text this morning. And I want to, that's why I prayed what I prayed, is I want to say it in a way that's understandable. In a way that we can walk away and go, oh yeah, I get it. I understand it. So, Lord, make me, help me to say it in a way that's understandable. So I'm going to invite you to turn to Ephesians chapter 1. Um, on my notes, I have a schedule to go through 14 verses this morning, but as I prepped it and prepped it and prepped it, I don't know if we'll get there today, but that's okay. That's okay. My goal is if we can't make it to 14, I want to get us to, to 6 at least. So, But I want to set up part of the message this morning. So if you're there, I've entitled the message, Recipients of God's Rendering, and you'll see where I'm going with that in a minute. But I want to begin, as, we as I introduce this text in Ephesians, I want us to think about being a recipient of what somebody else has done for us. Now, those who are watching, I'm going to ask in a minute, for the, the people that are sitting here, has anybody ever done anything for you? Has anybody ever given anything to you before? If so, raise your hand if you're here this morning. Okay, so we can all relate to the fact that people have done stuff for us and that we are the recipient of somebody else's work, okay, on our behalf. That's what I want us to think about this morning. So I want us to think about receiving a generous gift from someone and then how we might respond to that. Because that's the essence of what's going on in this first section in Ephesians. Matter of fact, the whole book of Ephesians is about that. It'll, it'll come back to everything we talk about from here on in. We'll come back to this idea of receiving a generous gift and then our response to it. Okay, This is exactly what's going to happen in the book of Ephesians. And what I want to do up front is I want to give you up front, if you're taking notes... I want to show you how the book of Ephesians is broken up. It's what, what you hear me say oftentimes when we do Bible study. It's called uh, the segment division. So how is, this, how is the book of Ephesians broken up by subject? And in chapter 1 through 3, we see our position in salvation or God's work of salvation on our behalf. So who we are because of what God has done for us. We're going to see that in the first three chapters and then later on, we're going to see the practice of that, and it's our walk in salvation. How we're to respond to what God has done for us, okay? And I thought it was a perfect, Ephesians is a perfect follow-up to the messages I've been doing, okay? So, before I get into verses 3 and 4 in a minute, I want to just quickly introduce verses 1 and 2, Okay? Paul says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, and that simply means he was sent on a mission. He had a purpose by God. And if you have been studying the book of Acts with us on Thursday night, you know from, a, from a Acts chapter 9 that he was called to be the preacher to the Gentiles. Well, the congregation he's talking to here in Ephesus is primarily Gentiles. Okay, they're not Jews, they're Gentiles. So he says, and I was the apostle of Christ, by God's will, which means he didn't go and say, I think I want to be an apostle one day. God was the one that called him on the road to Damascus, and if you look even in the book of Galatians, it says that he was set apart in his mother's womb. So God had already called, set apart Paul, to be his preacher to the Gentiles. It was God's will, God's desire that this would be what Paul would do. So he says, to the saints who are in Ephesus, so the, the, one, the saints are the ones that are called out, who are in Ephesus. And let me just give you a quick history lesson about Ephesus. If you go back to, uh, chap I believe it's chapter 19 in the book of Acts, you'll see the group that he's talking to. These people came out of a very pagan, idol-worshipping culture. At one point when they got saved in the, in the book of Acts chapter 19, they burned their magic arts. They burned their witchcraft. So they, they were coming out of this this whole idea of witchcraft, right? So when they got saved, and so what he's saying is to the saints who are at Ephesus, and, and they would have known who they are, who are faithful in Christ Jesus. The word faithful here doesn't refer to their conduct in the Greek. It refers to the fact that they, they have put their trust in Christ. They are faithful. They're saints. And what he's doing is he's basically calling them believers here. You're believers. 
You're faithful. Your, your position is that you've trusted Christ for salvation and you're faithful in that salvation, okay? So that's what he's, he's contrasting them to unbelievers who would have been in Ephesus, okay? So, and then verse 2, he says, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul will often introduce his epistles with grace and peace. And you think, well, is that just a nice greeting? Or is there something significant? Well, you can almost assume that it, there's something significant. Grace and peace are the two consistent aspects that God gives to us in salvation. We saw that in one of the messages earlier. Grace is basically a, an undeserved favor that's given freely with no expectation of return, which means it's a gift. Nothing can be given back. It's given as a gift, right? And it finds its motive, right, simply in the free-heartedness or the bounty of the giver. It, so it's not, it's not you deserve to get this, it's simply, I'm giving this to you as a free gift, undeserved gift, simply because it's who I am. It has nothing to do with us. That's what Paul's talking about. Grace to you. And then he says, peace. Peace is the idea of being untroubled, undisturbed tranquility and well-being. That's what it means, the word peace, from shalom in the Old Testament, which simply means uh, well-being. Produced by the heart as we are yielded to the Holy Spirit. So he says, grace and peace to you. Then he's going to go on, okay, starting, starting in verses 4 through 14, and I'll get you there in a minute. Paul's going to begin to talk about what God has done for us in salvation, okay? That's why I titled it Recipients of God's Rendering. The word rendering means simply somebody's done something for you. They've been the one to do the work on your behalf, okay? So we are simply recipients. And what I want us to understand in this message as we begin is the fact that salvation, you're going to see this very clearly in these first 14 verses, has what to do with us as Christians? Zero. Absolutely nothing if you're watching, right? This is all God's doing. The only part that we have in this whole aspect of salvation, according to the book of Ephesians, is the fact that we get to receive it. We've done nothing, nothing, nothing. And you'll see that as I go through in a minute and talk about how the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are the ones that did the work on our behalf. All we simply have to do is receive it, right? That's what I want us to understand, okay? But in verse 3, if you look at verse 3, it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Now, this is interesting. The word blessed that's used here in the Greek is used two ways. First of all, it's talk, talking about blessing God, and then it's talking about what God has done to bless us. So the very word that Paul uses to talk about God blessing us is the very word that, we're, that he uses for us to bless God. Has the same Greek word, but a different meaning, okay? So he says this, and I'll, I'm, gonna get to, I'm gonna get to the idea of bless, our blessing God later on, but I just wanna introduce it. The word blessed here that he uses in verse three, where he says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, simply means to, to speak well of. The, the, the word is where we get our English word eulogy. Now, think about it. What's a eulogy? A eulogy is when somebody dies, right? And the people get up and they speak at that funeral and they don't, okay, when's the last time you went to a funeral and they looked at the person, the dead person lying in the casket and, and started talking about all the negative things about him? Oh, that guy was horrible. He, he had a bad mouth. He, it, no, we eulogize people at a funeral, right? We don't talk about their negative faults. We talk about their good fault or their good aspects, right? And that's what the word eulogy here. And then he goes on to say, who has blessed us, right? So when we talk about God blessing us, it talks about not the fact that he speaks well of us, right? Because think about it. In, apart from Christ, does God really have anything good to say about us? Absolutely not. God can say nothing good about us other than the fact that he loves us because there's nothing good in us. So it's not when it talks about God blessing us, it's not talking about God saying good things about us. It's simply the, God, the, the idea that he does good for us. So when God blesses us, it's what he does for us. 
And then in return, we, out of our mouths, speak good things about what God has done for us. Okay? That's what Paul is talking about. We, we, are, uh, we, we are the recipients of what he's done. And he goes on to say in verse 3, we've been blessed in the heavenly realms. Okay? We have been blessed in the heavenly realms in Christ. What does he mean by that? Okay? Which means we have, re- we have, been, we have received blessings that are supernatural, that come from the Holy Spirit, that are not part of the natural order, but are part of God's order in heaven. Okay, that's really what Paul is talking about when he says we have been, God has done good things for us. And what's interesting, he has blessed us uh, in the heavenly with all spiritual blessings, right? Which means there's more than one spiritual blessing. It's a package deal. It's a series of things that God has done that are good for us even though we don't deserve it, right? That's what Paul is talking about. And it comes from the Holy Spirit. It comes from the throne of God in the heavenlies. It's not something that's from the earth. It's something that comes from the heavenlies, okay? So really what he's saying is, is we have been, we have benefited. He has prospered us with every spiritual thing that we need for this spiritual walk with Christ, okay? And they're, they're already bestowed on us, so we don't have to ask for them. We don't have to ask for these blessings. Once we come to Christ, they're already ours. We simply just need to appropriate them. We simply need to put them into practice, okay? Right? And then in verse 4, in verse 4, he begins to explain the reason for receiving the blessings, okay? Listen to what he says in verse 4. He said, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. The word just as there basically talks about how we, why God is blessing us. This is the reason for God blessing us with every spiritual blessing because God chose us, all right? And so the idea here is, church, you and I would not receive these blessings if it were not for our salvation, God would not have done any of this for us had he not chosen us in Christ, okay? Now, you got to understand something. That's significant. What do we deserve apart from God's salvation, church? Well, you could say we deserve nothing, but that isn't even theologically correct. We deserve God's wrath. We deserve the punishment of God's wrath, which is Eternal separation from God and hell. I, people don't like to hear that in our culture today. They don't like to hear the fact that God wants, God will have to condemn us apart from Christ. God doesn't want to. God loves us. We'll see that in the text this morning. God loves us and he wants to bestow this on every human being. But there are those who will reject him. And because of that, rejecting that free gift and rejecting the holiness of God, God has to give them his wrath. He has to punish people or he would be going against his own character. So there's nothing good in us, right? It's simply God giving it to us and it only comes about at the end of verse 3 in Christ. These blessings that I'm going to talk about this morning and next week are only for those who, ha- who are in Christ, who, who are in right relationship with Jesus Christ. Okay, so it explains the reason for the blessings, and it's the way we get them. That's really what Paul is saying, okay? So let's look at verses, I don't know how far we'll get today, possibly just uh, four through six. But as we begin to look at these, I want us to think about this thought. We are recipients of every spiritual blessing because of or by the way of God's rendering. So God's work on our behalf. The only way we can have these blessings is because of what God has done for us. You understand that? Which is why he says grace and peace. Because we don't deserve these. God is the one that's chosen to give them to us. And the only reason he's given them to, it to us is because of that salvation experience, that relationship with Christ. Apart from Christ, we would have no access to any of these things. And what I want us to, sh- I want to show us, I, again, I said, I don't know how far I'll get, 
but I want to I foreshadow something for you in a minute. So if you look at verse 4, look at verse 4, I want you to see the phrase, um, in him. Can you see it in your Bible? God chose us in him. You see that phrase? Okay, and then if you look ahead to verse 7, right, it says what? In him we have redemption. Okay, you see that? It's a repeated phrase, in him, that means in Christ. And then if you look ahead again to verse 13, look at what it says in verse 13. In him, you also having listened to the message, were sealed in him. So what I want to show us this morning, if you're taking notes, is I want, you to, I want you to see God's acting, God's work on our behalf in Christ. I want us to see, first of all, God the Father, what he did. I want us to see what Jesus did, and I want us to see what the Spirit does. I don't know if you've ever seen this in, in Ephesians 1 before, but all three of the Godhead are involved in salvation. All of them, not just Jesus. Jesus. Because we think it's always Jesus, right? We think it's on the cross, right? Yeah, what he did was, we'll see that in the second set of verses. But God had a hand in salvation. So did the Holy Spirit. They all are equally active in our salvation. So the next time you want to give God praise for salvation, be sure you don't just give it to Jesus. Be sure you give it to the Father and the Spirit as well because they're all actively involved in this salvation. Let me show you let me show you God the Father's part this morning in verses 4 through 6. Okay? This is God's election. So if you're taking notes, and this is a tricky one. People have a hard time understanding this. People who don't understand what the Scripture says about this reject this thought. Okay? And it's a hard one to, to understand. And the only way we can understand it is by the Holy Spirit's enlightenment. Otherwise, we, we won't get it. Okay? So listen to what... Paul says, so all these blessings are coming because of what he did in verse 4, okay? He says, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him. Okay, let me just stop there for a second and talk about that, okay? So, this is the idea of God choosing those whom he would save, all right? Already, already, the red flags are going up for some people. The hair is raised on the back of your neck and go, well, hold on a minute. That's not fair. God chose people to, to save and send to heaven, and he didn't choose others, and he's sending them to hell. Let me explain that. I'm, okay, That's not the way Scripture defines it, but let me explain it. So he chose us, which means he was sovereign because God knows all, because God is perfect. God knows what he's doing. His sovereign work of choosing some believers for his purpose. That's what the idea of choosing means. It means to pick out for oneself, okay? So, so you look among the masses, and you pick out some for yourself, right? For your purpose, okay? Now, let me explain this. The idea of choosing precludes the idea that those who weren't selected are rejected, okay? Okay? You get that? That's important to understand, okay? So before the foundation of the world, God chose us, believers. Let me, try to, let me try to explain this, okay? So I'm a soccer coach. I've coached soccer for many years now. Um, and let's say as a soccer coach, my goal is to pick a team that's going to win the state championship, right? That's my goal. Okay, so I might have tryouts. I might have an open sign-up where I invite all the soccer players from Nina to come um, and be on my team, right? And let's say 200 of them respond. So 200 respond, and my goal, again, my purpose and my goal is to win a state championship, right? Okay, I hate to say this, but there are some soccer players that are not as good as others. And so if my purpose is to win the state championship, I'm not going to pick the bad players. That's not being mean. That's simply, that goes against my stated purpose, right? So I, 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 I've got to try out for a week. I've got my 200 players. And if you know anything about soccer, I need 11 players on the field at one time. And I probably need anywhere from probably four to potentially seven subs. Right? Because people get hurt, people get tired, 
you got to learn to sub. You know, that's part of the strategy, right? So I'm going to pick 18 out of the 200, right? And you say, well, that's not fair, coach. What about the other 182 that you didn't pick? That's being kind of mean, right? No, they don't fit my purposes. I'm not rejecting them. I'm not saying they're horrible soccer players. As a matter of fact, the majority of them may be really gifted soccer players, but they're either not as skilled as the 18 that I chose, or they don't work together the way that these 18 would, because soccer isn't just about skill. Soccer is about strategy, right? And I think, and I'll throw this one as an illustration, sometimes attitude is part of being a good player. I remember coaching junior varsity girls softball back uh, seven years after I graduated as I was student teaching. The most gifted player on the team was copping an attitude with me. Guess who sat the next game? She did. Because part of being a good player isn't just the skill, but it's the ability to work together as a team in the way that I want to organize the, you know, the players on the field. But part of it is mental stuff as well, attitude. Right? So as I'm coaching, I'm going to pick out, what have I said to those 182 that I haven't picked? I haven't rejected you. You just simply didn't meet my purposes. Right? In the same way, when Paul is saying here that God chose some for salvation and not others, it's not saying he rejected the others. He simply didn't choose them for his purpose. Okay? Lest you say, still, pastor, that's not fair. Let me say this. If you understand the scripture in Isaiah 56, 3, 6, it says, all like sheep have gone astray. Each have gone their own way. The reality is this. Visualize this for, for a minute. Pretend you have a timeline right here in front of you. There's a timeline where this way that goes to my right is following God's way. This way going to the left is following our own sinful way. Well, where is mankind? Where is all mankind in terms of following God's way? The Bible says in Romans 3, there's nobody righteous, no, not one, right? Which means nobody's going God's way. We're all going this way, right? So in all reality, if God did not step in and save any of us, where would we all be headed? This way, toward hell. All God is doing out of his grace and mercy and his purpose is he's simply, he's not, he, he's stopping some and turning them around to go his way. The reality is we all deserve that over here. And I remember one day in Bible study, one of my women sang to me, she said, Pastor, I understand this idea of choosing. I'm trying to wrap my head around it. It's hard to understand. She's, but she was crying, and I said, why are you crying? And she said, it's not because I don't get it. God's sovereign. God can do what he wants to do. She said, what I'm fearful for is the fact that my loved ones aren't chosen. She was crying. Well, guess what? I joined her in tears. I said, yes, that, I get that. But we've got to trust God that he knows what he's doing. He knows what his plan is. He knows what his purpose is. He knows who he needs for that. And, she's, and, and so the idea is people will say, well, it's not fair that God didn't pick everybody. Right? And I always throw this question back at him. What I consider to be unfair is not that God didn't pick everybody. But what's unfair is why did God pick me? Why? Think about your own life. Think about what your life like was like before Christ. If you were God, and you were putting together a plan for the ages to, to bring people to Christ and, and to draw people to the Lord through the gospel and to get people ready to go to heaven, would you have picked me if you knew me beforehand? I wouldn't have. If I were God, I wouldn't have picked me. I was the guy that folded my hands and said, I'm going to be a slave to nobody, including you, Jesus. I wouldn't have picked me. But God picked me and others for a purpose. And sometimes it's hard to understand his purpose. I know what my purpose is. I know what God has gifted me for and what he's using me for to help. Again, you got to wrestle with that one. I'm not asking you 
to necessarily listen to me today. If you're, if you're out here in the, the sanctuary or you're watching via Facebook Live, I'm not asking you today to wholeheartedly accept what I'm telling you. What I would say to, is this. Acts 17.11 says you need to be a Baran. If you're struggling with what I'm telling you, now you've got to remember, preaching is simply my work, my study, telling you what I found. Right? And there's a purpose in that. But if you really want to check this out, go study God's word for yourself. Go look at all the areas where he talks about choosing and predestined and all that kind of stuff. And I'll walk through it with you. I'll study through it with you. Or I'll let you study and then we can go back and talk and we can dialogue about it. Guys, I'm going to tell you, there's some things in the scripture that I don't understand. I don't. I can't grasp this completely. However, I trust God who knows what he's doing. And you know, the reality is without sounding cold, God has every right to pick whoever he wants to. Because the reality is we all deserve what we should have gotten apart from Christ. And so for those who have been chosen, and you know if you're chosen, because we talked about, right, bearing fruit in the last number of messages, you know you're saved because of what Scripture teaches and how you're living. I'll, I would say is, let me, let me just say this in, in, in application form. Think about my illustration about the soccer players. Okay, after I've just chosen the 18 soccer players, What kind of response do you think it would be if the 18 that were chosen looked at the 182 and went, na 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 I got picked and you didn't. That would be very ungracious, right? You wouldn't do that. You'd probably console the other ones. In the same way, those of us who are chosen, those of us who've received salvation, not because of anything we did, but because of what God ought to be appreciative and humbled by it, and be willing to share the gospel with other people. Because, listen, who knows who the chosen are? We're walking along the street any given day. And you meet an unbeliever. How do you know they're, they're not chosen? How do you know that? Because at one point, up until the age of 23, a believer could have saw, seen me at the age of 21 living the way I was living and go, ah, he's not chosen. But two years later, I was chosen, right? I mean, I was chosen, and I got saved. So we don't know. So we have to be really humble about the fact that we're chosen, not only in being gracious toward God and thinking this is all from you, but also how we relate to other people. We don't go around and say, well, I'm, a, I'm saved, and you're going to hell. No, 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 no. No. That's a wrong understanding of Scripture. We ought to walk in appreciation of our salvation with a heart for the gospel so that others can be saved. And s somebody would say, well, if God has already chosen people, then why do we need to share Jesus with them? Okay? So for those who are watching on Facebook Live, I'm turning to the right toward my wife. Okay? My wife, Lisa. She could have easily said, well... You know, Jim, if you meant Jim to be saved, then Jim will be saved. I don't have to do anything. I'm not convinced of that. God used my wife, along with one of my dear high school friends, to, to bring me to the point of salvation. So just because we're chosen doesn't mean we're not part of God's plan, right? God uses other, uh, other believers to draw the chosen to him. And God used Lisa and Randy to bring me to Christ. Now, what if they had said, whatever, you know, I don't know if he's saved or not. I don't know if he's chosen or not. Then let God deal with them. But God has picked Lisa and picked Randy so that he could then use them to minister the gospel to me. So we're all part of God's plan who are chosen, right? You get that? Is that understandable? As understandable as possible? <laughs> it's, this is a tough one. Ephesians 1, 1 through 14, it gets easier. This is the tough one, okay? All right, so let me show you this. So let me talk about the idea. He says he chose us before the foundation of the world. So this is when he chose us. Okay, this one blew my mind as I studied it this week. Okay, he chose us before the foundation of the world. Let me ask a question. 
If God is the one that sets people apart and picks them for himself so that he can use them for his salvation purposes, when did he do it? It says here before the foundation of the world, before the creation of the world, right? You could say, well, he did it one day or one nanosecond before he created the world, which probably, if you look at it carefully, probably is somewhere between six and 7,000 years ago. Good conservative scholars would say that we're not millions of years old like the atheists and like the evolutionists say. Biblically, we're probably six or 7,000 years old, the creation, Adam and Eve and the creation, right? Back to Genesis. So did he do it a nanosecond beforehand? That's what I used to think until I studied this week. Think about it. Is God omniscient? You know what I mean by that? Is God all-knowing? So if God's all-knowing, then tell me a time when he didn't know who he had chosen. So before the creation of the world doesn't mean a nanosecond before he laid the foundation. It means literally there was never a time in God's mind that he didn't already know who he had chosen. Okay, stop with me for on that one for a second. God didn't just at one point in time go, Oops, okay, I, I, I got to make sure those people, I, I get the right ones for my purposes. Oh, okay, uh, you know, like, we, we, we've got this picture sometimes of God being an old man, kind of worn out, sitting on a throne with a white beard, and he's kind of, you know, got half dementia. That's the way some people view God. God is completely omniscient. He's completely all-powerful. He knows everything from the beginning to end. So the, the point is, there really was, when Paul says before the foundation of the world, what he's really saying is, there was never a time when God didn't know who he had chosen. Okay, does that boggle your mind, church? There was never a time in God's mind that if you're chosen, that he had from, and I want to say, I want to say, in my limited vocabulary, I want to say, well, from the beginning of time, God chose me back then. But think about it. God has no beginning. So so there couldn't have been a thought outside of God's mind ever. Does that boggle your mind? Does that make you want to worship him? There was never a time when God didn't have me chosen, which makes me want to praise him in an even deeper way today. <laughs> Before, wow. And then he goes on to say, so we have the, this is the timing of his actions, then, that he says that we would be holy and blameless before him. This tells why he did it. What was the purpose of choosing certain people to salvation? That we would be holy and blameless before him. He didn't pick us so we could be saved and then go back to the way we lived before the cross. Think about it. I, I, didn't, pick that, I didn't pick those 18 soccer players to win the state championships only for them to get lazy on me and not be willing to do the sprints or the suicides or the, right? For those who are coaches in here, for those who've ever played a sport in here, how many of you remember doing suicides, right? I was a soccer player. That's longer than a basketball court. Suicides on a basketball court are a lot shorter than suicides on a soccer field or a football field, right, George? Lot, right? I didn't pick those, that team, that 18, to win the state championship for them to come slouching around every day and lazy and not want to work. I picked them so that they would work, right? In the same way, God chose us before the foundation of the world so that we would be purposeful for him, so that we would be holy and blameless. The word holy means set apart. Set apart from what, church? Set apart from our sin. Set apart from the unbeliever. Set apart from what we used to be, right? For his purpose. And the word blameless means to be faultless. Um, and it, it's a word that is a, it, it's a, it's a, a term that um, artists use, okay? Um, if you've ever thrown, pot, you've ever thrown uh, pottery on a wheel, if you've ever thrown pottery on a wheel, seen it thrown, it literally means, because what, what do you have in the middle of that clay? You have specks of sand, right? The impurities. And it's the idea that when you throw that clay to make that pot, you want to get as many of those impurities or that sand out of it as possible. That's what it's talking about. It's not talking about us being perfect or completely sinless. It's talking about us being without major fault in our life that somebody could look at us and say, well, you call yourself a Christian, but you use foul language, 
you, you, you know, you're, you're lusting after women. I mean, it could be, or you have a foul mouth or any of that, right? Doesn't mean we're completely free of sin, but it means we're faultless, where people would have to make up stuff about us like they did Daniel in the book of Daniel, right? Or Job. Job, is, we're told, is holy and blameless. Doesn't mean he was perfect, but it means his character was basically without fault. That's what he's talking about. That's what he desires of us. And it's talking about our character as a child of God, that those who have been chosen, that's their character, okay? Um, this is the purpose for him choosing us, okay? This is what we are in him, our position, like I talked about before, not what we need to be. This isn't talking about our sanctification. He'll talk about that later. This is talking about that we would be chosen, holy and blameless, in a, as a character, as a way of life. That's what we would be. Then he goes on to say, then he goes on to say in the next verse, he predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself according to the kind intention of his will. Okay? So he predestined us. He didn't just choose us. He predestined us. The word predestined means to predetermine. So it's, it's, it's the idea of predetermining something before you choose them. So it's almost like this should go backwards. It almost, it almost should say he predestined us, then he chose us. Right? So he predetermined who he wanted, and then he acted on it. That's the choosing. The predetermining is making up your mind. Right? What you want. Okay, um, that's what he's talking about. So he predestined us, right? He predetermined who he would choose. How did he do it? Look at this. This is amazing. How did he do it? Um, in verse 5, uh, at the end of verse 4. Actually, the verse 4 goes with 5, in love. How did he do it? He chose us in love. It's the only way he could have chosen us. He didn't choose us to be saved. He didn't choose us for his purposes because there was anything good in us. He didn't look down and go, oh, Jim, what a great guy. I think I'll pick you. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? In the same way the coach goes, I'm going to pick them because they're a hard worker. I, I have an affection for them. They, they, they want to please me as their coach. They, they're, they're willing to work hard. Not, so it's not just their talent. So it's kind of like that. He did it out of himself, his love, not because of anything we did, right? This is the, again, this is the reason behind his actions. And what did he predestine us to? To adoption as sons, okay? This is what he chose us to. That we would become adopted as sons and as a result, joint heirs with Christ. Okay, now you gotta understand something. We've been sinners, right, before Christ, his purpose, his first purpose is to choose us to become his sons and daughters. Now, you've got to understand something about adoption in, in Roman times, okay? So, if somebody came along and you were a ward of the state, and they decided, hey, I want another child, and I'm going to pick you, okay? They did it. And they made you part of their family. So you went from being literally nobody to being in the house of the, fa the father who chose you. And you, because of that, you were given all legal rights to everything the father has as if you were a natural born child. That's huge. Particularly in Paul's day. That's huge. Which means you're raised to the status of a natural child. And what Paul's talking about here, when he talks about the adoption as sons and daughters, or another way of putting it would be children of God. He's our father, we're his children, right? We have to understand that we are, we are in one sense raised to the status of Jesus Christ in that we receive all the benefits and blessings that the natural born son or the son of God would receive, which means everything that God was going to give to him in terms of eternity, God gives to us. Now, that ought to make us go, wow. Really? So I went from a sinner who deserved God's wrath to elevated status as an adult son, right? By the way, and the, and the reason why it's not a young son, it's an adult son, is because you don't get an inheritance in that culture until you are an adult. 
So we, are, so we get our inheritance in, in God, in Christ, as an adult son. That's what, that was the way he blessed us, to give us all the things that a natural-born son would have, right? And we, we got it through Christ, okay? And it's through him. That was the way it happened. That was the purpose of why he did what he did. And if you want to look at a couple of cross-references, I have Romans 8.15, uh, and John 1, 12 and 8, 35. John 1, 12 simply says this. That by believing in Jesus, he gave us the right to be sons of God. We are not sons and children of God. We, are, we have no inheritance with God apart from Christ. But in him, by believing in him, we now have that adoption to be his sons. And it happened through Jesus Christ. And how? Verse 5. Look at how he did it. According to the kind intention of his will. Even if you don't understand what the Greek means. According to the kind intention of his will. Puts the, puts the choosing. Puts the onus of the choosing on the, the one who chose or the chosen. If it's the kind intention of his will. Right? Not because of anything we did. It's because of his. Who he is. Right? And it's interesting because the phrase in the Greek means this, simply not strictly in the sense of kindly or a friendly feeling, but because it pleased him. So he, he made us, he chose us, he predetermined, he chose us, and he made us his children. He adopted us as his kids because it pleased him. Not because we were pleasing, but because it pleased him. And he knew what he was doing. He knew what his purpose was. Okay? That's what it means. And it's interesting. Okay? This expresses the fact that the election in God's foreordination or his predestination of us to adoption are not due to anything in us, but completely are acts of his own goodness. And it originates wholly in his loving will. Picked me because he knew. He loved me and because he wanted to use me and he knew how he could use me. And then finally, and I'm going to end here this morning. Or I'm going to, yeah, I'm going to end here this morning in verse 5. What was the purpose of him doing it? To the praise of his glory. The glory of his grace in which he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. You're going to see this phrase. To the praise of his glory used three times, right? In terms of the, what the Father does, in terms of what the Son does, and what the Spirit does. All of the things that each aspects of the Godhead do, they do it for the final reason that we would be to the praise of his glory, right? So, why did he pick us? He picked us to the praise of his glory so that God would be glorified as we exemplify his holy and blameless nature in our life. Which, another way of putting it is, people are going to look at what God has done to us and through us, and they're going to say, that's got to be God. That's got to be God. Today, people look at me, who've known me for years. How many, by the way, how many of you still connect with uh, classmates from high school? Still do, right? Well, let's just put it this way. I was known in high school as, <laughs> do I dare say it? Okay, one of my reputations was I was a pest. I thought I would at least for the senior year get the, the award of class clown. I wasn't even that good. I was the class pest. I bugged everybody in high school. Okay, I was known as that. I was known for my vulgar mouth. I mean, I was known for a lot of bad things. And if you could put me in front of my classmates today and let me spend some time with them, they would have to say there's been a change in this guy since we knew him in 1979. There's got to be a change. I wonder what that change is. And if they're around me long enough, they're going to have to say, that's not you, Jim. That's got to be something else. There's got to be some other effect on you. And hopefully they would point to the fact 
that God was the one that did it, that God would get the glory for it. And listen to what he says. Um, He says in verse uh, 6, to the praise of the glory of his grace. So it would be people praising God's grace, all the work in my life, not because of anything I've done, but because what God has done as a free gift in my life, which he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. You know what the word freely bestowed means in the Greek? I I thought this was so cool. To pursue with grace. To pursue with grace. What Paul is really saying is that all of what God is doing in my life, God's part in my life and choosing me and predetermining me and, you know, setting me apart so that I could be to, to do, to be holy and blameless. All of this is because God hotly pursued me with his free gift of grace. It was almost like, you've heard people talk about irresistible grace, right? To the point where I, God was so pursuing me with his grace I couldn't, have, I couldn't have defended myself. That's how incredible God's grace is in our life. I'm going to end there today, and I'll simply say this. What we've seen in the message this morning, I know it's hard to understand. I, I pray that I've explained it in a way. If you have more questions, I would love to talk to you. And this is stuff I've been studying for 25 or 30 years. And just so you know, after 25 or 30 years, I still don't understand it completely. I'm still trying to figure it out. But I have a handle enough now to be able to help people understand. And again, it's unfathomable. Why God would pick me out beforehand, why God would choose me, why God would want to use me knowing who I am. But I have to simply remind myself, I don't understand it, but I receive it graciously and humbly by God's incredible grace. And Lord, help me be used of you in the way that you want me to be used. Let's pray real quickly. Father, we thank you for this message. Lord, it's hard to understand. I pray that I've explained it in a way that is understandable. Lord, I pray that that people would continue to meditate on these scriptures and would look at some cross-references. Lord, we don't get it. We, we 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 may not in our flesh think it's fair. But Lord... You're a just God. And so how can we say that you're not fair because one of your character qualities is to be just? Lord, we may not understand it. We may not think it's fair, but for those who have received it, help us just to appreciate it and to live it out and to praise you for it. Lord, and I pray that we would just, as we understand more and more what you've done for us in salvation, that we would simply declare with our tongue, your goodness. The fact that this is all about you and not about us. Like Paul says, if I'm going to boast in anything, it's not going to be me. I'm going to simply boast in the cross of Christ. May we do that this week as we declare your praises, what you've done for us. Grace, we pray in Jesus' name.